2023 American Urological Association annual meeting is well underway in the Windy City, where thousands of urologic professionals have convened to discuss the latest in urology and urologic care. AUA TV starts right now. Hello and welcome everyone to another exciting day at the 2023 AUA Annual Meeting here in Chicago. My name is Dina Baer and I'll be bringing you all the latest from this year's annual meeting. Stay tuned as we'll continue to cover all of the latest in the field of urologic care, highlighting organizations that are at the forefront of the field and also speaking to experts that are here on site about some of the leading topics at this year's meeting. First, let's see what some of you had to say about our question of the day. I've been really impressed by the focus on women's health and um, more female panelists and kind of looking at things that I've always been focused on, which is, you know, the importance of female health, UTI prevention, vaginal estrogen, and how that's getting a name on the big stage, which has been great. There has been a lot of new technology, new products, new treatments is approved and coming up. So that can help for urologists all over the world to implement in their private practice or hospital-based practice to give patients uh, good care. I'm a andrology and infertility fellow, so a lot of the sessions that I've been going to have been both in sexual medicine or in the, in the fertility realm. And for me, one of the largest takes, takeaways are the power of collaboration across institutions. And so across these specialty society meetings, uh, seeing folks putting together data, finding ways to work across regions, across institutions, to try to have a larger impact um, has been really wonderful to see. I have been very impressed, first of all, to see so many people because we've been without so many people for so many years. So I think that's the first thing. I've been very, very happy to catch up with you know, old friends and, and meet new ones. Um, I think I've also, um, I'm in female urology, and I've been very impressed with the new, the new learners and the new science that they're bringing. So that's been very exciting to me. Dr. Stephen Kaplan is here now talking about benign prostate hyperplasia and giving a lecture on predicting the future. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. So give us a little insight into BPH as it relates to the future. Well, it's interesting because uh, predicting it is going to be a challenge. In fact, uh, as part of my talk, I went into ChatGPT because, of course, they know everything. And they answered me, we don't know. So I figured, all right, well, I'll give Chat Gaplin GPT. And that means uh, we're going to, we, we may not know what's going to happen, but we're going to be confident, at least in predicting it. Uh, and I think we have to really define what that actually means. And I'm going to be defining it differently and try to be a little provocative and have uh, more thought-provoking uh, ideas about where we're going in the future. Let's talk about more specifically the idea of treatment in the future. I think really what we need to focus on is before we actually get to therapy, what are some of the other things that we can actually do? So for example, uh, better information. We'll also talk about our, uh, our really doing better with underrepresented uh, minorities because we're not catching those patients as well, and I think there's a lot of great opportunity. We'll talk about diagnostics, because I really think that's the exciting place. Try to get patients in earlier. We learned from COVID, people would rather not come into the doctor's office if they can't. So why not develop diagnostic ways of patients to actually give their diagnosis remotely? So we'll talk about some new technologies, very, very cool, uh, that actually are doing remote care I mean, I'm wearing here an Apple Watch so I can transmit my heart rate and blood pressure. Well, hopefully we'll be able to transmit urologic information in the future. I, and I have no doubt that that's going to happen. In fact, now uh, Medicare has given a, a code for remote care and, uh, and remote monitoring. And looking at technologies that are going to allow that is going to be very, very important. So we're excited to, about the diagnostic side. And yes, there are therapies. There are the current therapies that are out there. And... Um, I'm a little bit of a contrarian, um, but I think a lot of the therapies are guided not just by the data, but by reimbursement. So I think as reimbursement changes, uh, all of a sudden the scientific data may be less relied on. But we're excited about some new technologies, for sure. So I'm the principal investigator for something called Optolum, which is a balloon dilation. 
we're kind of excited about it because it's the best data we've ever seen with an office procedure, I mean, by far. Um, so that will hopefully uh, be a new technology modality we can deliver to patients. But I think getting the patient informed, getting the patient diagnosed, and then to therapy is the approach, and that's what we'll be emphasizing. Given so many exciting possibilities, opening the door to this conversation, what do you want attendees to take away from your lecture? Oh, that BPH is a very unsettled and exciting field. Because uh, people think, well, you know, we just give a pill, we'll just do a scraping of the prostate or a laser and we're done. Hardly. I mean, the, the potential for growth in that space is enormous. And it's the most common diagnosis urologist makes is BPH. So there's enormous opportunity to actually inform patients better, to get the right patients to come in, to get the right patient to have procedures done, and to hone in on that. So there'll be new therapies, new diagnostics. I think it's a great time if people want, from an innovative perspective, from a patient perspective, and from a urology perspective, it's a great place to be. You've gotten the ball rolling for both physicians and patients. Thank you, doctor. My pleasure. Thank you. Let's go ahead and start our tour of organizations that are at the forefront of urology and urologic care in Pennsylvania. The Lehigh Valley Health Network Division of Urology is focused on delivering personalized, state-of-the-art care for patients in a collegial environment. All of that results in a practice where you can see and treat a variety of urologic conditions with the full support of a strong group. Let's take a closer look. Lehigh Valley Health Network Urology is delivering state-of-the-art care, physicians, APCs, and office staff working at the top of their license, and efficiencies in the OR and in the office. The idea is to utilize the best concepts of academic medicine and bring them to the community setting. So we have four different unique centers of excellence within the urology program. We have oncology and advanced robotics. We have men's health, BPH, and male infertility. We have endourology and stone disease, and the fourth center is female urology and pelvic reconstruction. It allows us to drive clinical innovation, improve the efficiencies, improve overall patient outcomes. We are able to use our APCs as first line for our patients so they can get the care they need faster. They can get triaged to the operating room to the procedure that they may need. This then opens up the attending schedule so they can operate, they can do these procedures that the APCs perhaps can't do, and we can be there to be the first lines and still give the patients the best care. Now let's head to Iowa, where the University of Iowa Department of Urology has the most advanced early stage bladder cancer treatment program in the world. Let's take a closer look. I came here as a result of leading a national trial in bladder cancer. It turned out the study gave us a lot of information, but it didn't advance the field far enough. But it got me on the road to doing more things. And what I was particularly enthusiastic about from coming here was, this was the one place that basically said, tell us what you need, do what you want, and we'll help you. And, and so I got basically carte blanche permission to start doing these combinations in patients on a compassionate use basis. The ones that looked really good, like the Gemdosi, we were able to then uh, consolidate and, and, and put, funnel more patients into it, generate the numbers that we needed to prove to ourselves and to the world that this stuff really works. It's a miracle to me. Save me. He saved my life. And what he was doing, and he didn't have to do this, but he did it because it mattered to him and he wanted to impact the quality of lives of other people. The Division of Urologic Surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston not only offers extraordinary care to urology patients, but also excels in innovative and groundbreaking urologic treatment techniques. Let's see how this teaching hospital makes it happen. Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center is one of the primary teaching hospitals affiliated with Harvard Medical School. BI serves as a major teaching hospital for medical students, residents, and fellows providing them with a comprehensive and diverse clinical experience. The strong research infrastructure within our department, the FIRST program that stands for Facilitating Innovative Research and Surgical Trials, jump starts and overcomes many of the challenging steps to initiate a research project, making it easier for our trainees to focus on developing the necessary ideas and processes to advance research. 
We are particularly proud of the advances in our minimally invasive urologic surgery program, particularly in the area of advanced bladder cancer and urinary reconstruction. The use of single port robot surgery to provide ultra minimally invasive care, focal therapy for prostate cancer care, and transgender reaffirming surgery programs. Mayo Clinic's premier urology practice in Arizona excels in diagnosing and treating problems involving the male and female urinary tract and the male reproductive organs. From curing cancer to restoring fertility, treating kidney stones to addressing incontinence, the care Mayo Clinic and Arizona urology experts deliver touches all aspects of life. Today we're going to be doing a case of a partial nephrectomy for a renal tumor. Bilateral native nephroeurectomy with salvage radical cystic prostatectomy. Today we'll be doing a homium laser enucleation with tissue morselization. A mini PCNL. This is a slightly more minimally invasive associated with less pain. And uh, I think this is going to have a really meaningful outcome from this. Surgery actually is very impactful in improving quality of life. I have the great pleasure right now of being joined by the rising star in urology research award recipient, Dr. Ryan Flanagan. First off, I want to say congratulations. Thank you so much. So grateful for the award. So thank you for being here. Tell me a little bit about the research that garnered you this award. One of my areas of interest is uh, something called non-obstructive vasospermia. So these are male patients that don't produce any sperm, at least from uh, surgical treatments with micro we might be able to find sperm half of the time, but the other half the time we really don't have any options. So what to do about it? Um, and this is where most of my research focus is. Um, the topic of the research grant uh, for this award was how do we create a pipeline for creating a regenerative uh, therapy for, for these patients? So um, the concept is that we're trying to understand how the cells are misbehaving that are not supporting the process of sperm production and identify some key pathways that we can target in a precision medicine type of fashion. And then uh, on the back end, how do we help support these cells to grow um, in the lab, in vitro, so that it can be paired with something like IVF. So we're using 3D bioprinting to try to get the cell patterning or the environment uh, just like we see it in the human body, so it can help support those stem cells to turn into sperm. And then the later parts of the, the grant are to integrate some of that computational information that we've learned about cell function and differentiation, and then apply it to what we're creating and bi bioprinting uh, in vitro. Such a potential great impact for patients who've been struggling with infertility, feeling horribly about it, thinking that there's hope. Yeah, you know, since we published some of our, our early studies, I've had a lot of patients around the world reach out with emails. Where is the research at? Is, is there any way I can be part of this? Uh, so it's, you know, really heartwarming that, um, you know, it seems like it's, it's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, obviously, and, and this is really the early stages of trying to set the groundwork um, for it with, within our lab and integrating all the great work that's been done uh, from others in our field, you know, before me. And how does winning this award maybe open the door for a potential further research project to really push this forward? 
It, you know, it's, it, it helps in so many ways. Um, it helps in terms of visibility on the topic. It helps in terms of forming, you know, meaningful collaborations with others locally, nationally, internationally. And then also just the funding itself, it allows us to, you know, dedicate more time to it, to hire more people, um, get more brains working on this project and, and really accelerate its development. If I'm a physician who treats infertility, if I am a male patient who is infertile, I'm asking one question, and that is, when might this be in clinical use? It's <sighs> a really good question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's probably many years away, is my, my guess. There's so many stages of development, and one, creating the technology, understanding the science, creating the technology, applying it, and then, you know, really importantly, gain the safety data. If we can get there, making sure we're doing good things and we're not doing anything harmful. Um, so there's a lot of steps to development, but you know, it's a, it's a process and incrementally you get the check boxes, make the, the incremental developments and, and hopefully we arrive there as a field um, through, through working together. Oh, we're so glad you're working on it. Congratulations on your award and your research. Dr. Flanagan, thank you. Thank you very much for this interview. Dr. Ralph Clayman is here now talking about innovation in urology. Thank you so much for joining me. So when it comes to innovation in urology, why is it important to take it from a seminal why to a functional how? Why is the question. So the why is, you're looking at something and going, well, why is it this way? Why are we still doing that? Um, why did this happen to my patient? And so that's a question that's going to stimulate basically your creative thought. The action part then is, well, how do we change this? How do we make things better? How do we alter the status quo? How do we prevent this from happening in another patient? So why is the creative impetus? How is the action item? So what does that look like for professionals in neurologic care? I think that urology is a very unique specialty. Uh, I think as a group, urologists are incredibly creative, inventive, curious, um, and out of that has come just a host of things over the years. In my own situation, we've seen endourology, laparoscopy, robotics all come into urology. It was the, uh, the creati creativity of the urologist who saw the benefit in robotic surgery. Um, you know, uh, if you look at the history, at least in the United States, it was money men and going, hey, laparoscopic surgery is just a little bit too difficult for doing prostates, and he was right. Let's look at the robot, and it, it changed everything. Um, as uh, the founder of Intuitive would tell you, um, from their standpoint, they looked at their robot as something for cardiac surgery. And what he is very glib about saying, but also very happy about saying is, we aim for the heart, we hit the prostate. But this is, speaks to the creativity and the imagination of the urologic surgeon and the willingness to change. The idea that no matter what we're doing today, it probably is not as good as what we could be doing tomorrow for our patients. Let's go down that road. And what are you hoping attendees take away from your lecture? Once you know your create skills and your innovative personality, then you have the ability to go out and identify other people who don't duplicate those skills and personalities, but who actually complement them. So then you wind up with a complete team of individuals who cover all the bases of creativity, all the bases of innovative personalities. And with that team, you are then able to go ahead and make a change if that change is worth making. So the innovation requires there to be an urgency. Why are you doing this? What is the purpose of this? And then you need to know, do I have the environment in which to do it? Do I have a laboratory? Do I have the time to do this? Do I have some people outside of urology who are willing to help back me in this? Dr. Clayman, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. I have the pleasure now of being joined by Dr. Sanjay Kolkarne, and you are giving a wonderful speech, I think. So it's entitled, If We Follow Guidelines, Then Who Will Invent? It's a great question, encouraging people to think outside the box. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about your talk. 
Yeah. So currently, I am the president of Urology Society of India. Uh, India is the largest populous country in the world today, more than China. And with the limited resources, we have to solve patients' problems. So well, the idea is, um, Steve Jobs once said that innovators are differentiated between followers. You understand? So innovators are important compared to those who follow. Uh, there is a problem. Then we go to the books and try to solve the problem. Then go to the journals, talk to the colleagues, go to internet. And if we think, if I think, if I'm the patient, am I willing to do the same surgery? And many times the answer is no. And then you can come out with a solution out of the box. Whatever we advocate to the patient, we are not willing to do on ourselves. And then this is a step towards innovation. So we have to have a mind which will give the best treatment possible to the patient. Clearly there is advancement in research and technology that changes things, but guidelines are still important. So how do the guidelines coexist with the innovations and the innovators? So guidelines are important for routine problems because suppose in a department, there are one, two, three, four, five urologists working together, then they have to investigate and treat the patient according to guidelines so that there is a standard of pattern. You understand? So the patient, if he go goes and sees a particular urologist or a B particular urologist, the treatment should be reasonably the same. But there has to be an innovator who can think outside the box and try to solve the problem in a better way. And that's where innovation comes into form. So how do you hope to inspire the attendees who are listening to your talk? So I'm going to show five different innovations published by me, two minute videos, just to show you how we do it differently. So the idea was there is a technique called Kulkarni urethroplasty, which, is, which I invented in 1997, long time ago. Then it took modifications and 2009, we had the final version. And then it is now accepted worldwide as a Kulkarni technique of urethroplasty, uh, where we make an incision onto the perineum. We invert the penis into perineum. You know, like you open up a banana, then we, we have the whole penis and the bulbar urethra is a single unit. And then we mobilize urethra on one side, open it at 12 o'clock. We take two pieces of buccal mucosa, one from each side. We put it across. We quilt it like a quilt and then we derotate the urethra, we pull the penis up and the whole pan urethroplasty, the penile and the bulbar urethroplasty is performed through a small incision just below the testis. So there are a lot of advantages of this technique and now it has gone into the American textbooks. If you have one piece of advice for the attendees when they leave your talk, what would it be? Uh, think out of the box. Think you are the patient. Are you willing to do the same surgery which you are advocating to your patient? And the answer many times is no. And that, that's innovation. Great advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So the AUA Institute for Leadership in Business is a great new initiative by the American Neurological Association to really provide leadership, business, and non-clinical education for urologists and other urologic providers. I think the real value of having non-clinical education on business and leadership is really, that's what our organization and our members are looking for. We've always done a great job over many years of providing excellent clinical content and clinical educational material, but our members want to know about compensation, practice patterns, practice environments, how they can rise up in their different organizations to different leadership roles. And the whole goal of this is to provide them the tools and the skills to do so. So the resources are fairly extensive and it ranges from everything as simple as podcasts, which are free to all members of the American Neurological Association and really cover very simple topics such as compensation, practice environments, contract negotiation. And then as time goes on, there's more resources that are available. For example, at the AUA meeting this year, there's a whole track that's geared towards business and leadership, compensation, practice management, time efficiency, as well as different tools for leadership growth.
How do you get involved in the Institute for Leadership and Business? First and foremost, become an AUA member. That gives you, first of all, a lot of resources that are readily available that you can take advantage of from your home, at work, without even traveling to a meeting. And then I would say if you're at the meeting, take advantage of the Institute Leadership and Business track, where you have opportunity for almost eight hours of education across a variety of different domains, and you can take advantage of it during all the days of the meeting. Well, that's it for us this year in Chicago. We hope you've enjoyed our program, and make sure to tune in on our televisions throughout the convention center, in the shuttle buses, your hotel room, and online. We'll see you again next year in San Antonio. Thank you.